This sourdough recipe is 50% wholemeal flour and 50% strong white bread flour for a loaf with all that wholesome goodness that still retains its lightness. You can stone bake it if you want to or do it in a Dutch oven and I'm gonna show you both. Roll it! Hey home bakers, this loaf is a variation of your standard sourdough recipe you all know and love from video 101. That's 99 videos ago. Woo! It's about time we did a wholemeal version, isn't it? Before we begin, there's four very important things we need to discuss and don't click away because I said it's very important. Number one, this is a three day process. Day one, you feed your starter, takes like 20 seconds. Day two, you make your dough. It's gonna be five hours start to finish and then you pop it in the fridge and day three, you bake it. It sounds like a lot, it's really not. Second thing is that it's 22 degrees C in here, that's 71.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature it was on the day I did this recipe. If it's warmer where you are, things are gonna happen a little faster. And if it's cooler where you are, you might need to leave things a little bit longer, but you already knew that, didn't you? Thirdly, another question I get asked loads. My starter is made out of wholemeal rye flour. That's why it looks kind of gray brown color and that's why it's so thick. I use wholemeal rye because I like the flavor and also I feel like it makes a starter, it's a little bit more robust a little bit more able to withstand neglect. And that's a priority for me. Also, there is no maintenance regime here. There's no maintenance, there's no daily, weekly feeding. There's no discard. I use the scrapings method. I just keep the scrapings in the bottom of the jar ready for next time. And as long as I bake on the regular, I can just feed it up to what I need it, leave it overnight and it's good to go. Then I scoop it out, leave the starter scrapings for next time. You're gonna need a starter. If you haven't got one, you haven't made one, I will put a link underneath for my sourdough starter recipe and also a link to an ancient video where a very young me will really awkwardly explain to you what the sourdough scrapings technique actually is. With all that out of the way, cut to the table. It's day one in the evening and I'm going to feed my starter. I normally do this before I go to bed, around about nine o'clock-ish. If I forget, I'll do it at 10 o'clock. Ish. And if I feel like I'm gonna forget, well, then I might do it at eight o'clock if I think I'm gonna forget later on. The point is, do it in the evening before we go to bed at some point. Here's the scrapings I have in my jar that I was talking about earlier. It's just the bare minimum clinging to the edges and clinging to the bottom of the jar from the last time I made sourdough. This process is a loop. It's really hard to know where to begin. So I'm gonna begin here and hopefully the rest will make sense. I need 100 grams of sourdough starter for this recipe, and if it's half flour and half water, well then I need 50 grams of each, don't I? There is a thermometer in my jug of water, and that tells me that I've made the water 22 degrees C, the same as the temperature of my room on the day. I find it easier to have a batch of water like this at the correct temperature, and then weigh out the quantity that you need. If you feel like it's gonna be colder in your home overnight, feel free to use water, it's a little bit warmer. It will give your starter a little boost in the beginning and everything will come down to room temperature anyway by the morning, so it'll probably be okay. With your jar on the scales, pour in 50 grams of water and then use a spoon to just kind of scrape up and pick up all that natural yeast rich starter from before. Remember, we are looking after a community of natural yeast within your starter. That's what we're doing, we're giving it a home. Those scrapings that you saw in the jar are already full to bursting of those natural yeasts. All we gotta do is give it food. It will eat the food, it will multiply, therefore making bubbles. That's what we want in our bread. Next, we're gonna put in 50 grams of a wholemeal rye flour and mix it up into a thick, thick paste. Use the edge of your spoon to clean down the edges and pat your mixture flat on the top. If everything is flat, nice and neat and tidy, you can see by the morning just how much it's risen up. If you want to, you can put an elastic band on it or some people draw on it with like a wipeable marker. That way you can see by the morning exactly how much it's risen, but I don't do that. Um, I just, I don't. If you want to, use a spatula like this and you can really clean down those edges and get them all nice. Yeah, nice. Then you're gonna leave it on your kitchen side at room temperature until tomorrow and go to bed. And now it's day two in the morning. You can see that my starter is puffed up. There's two things you're looking for here, bubbles and increase in volume. That's it, because that's what we want our starter to do in our final dough. If it's happening now, it's gonna happen in our dough. Here is evident. I can see with my eyeballs that there are air bubbles in here and it is increased in volume. 
This is what you are looking for. I never do the float test here. You might have heard about floating on a bit of water to see if it's ready or not. I can see that there's air bubbles in it and it is increased in volume. And that is what the float test is there to show me. I already know that. I can see it with my eyeballs. Also, because it's wholemeal rye flour, if I take a big scoop out of this, there's no kind of gluten present to hold that structure of the bubble. So likely what happened is I'll lose the air out of it on the transfer to a little glass of water for no apparent reason. And then it will sink anyway. And I think, oh no, it's not ready. And I get really stressed out about it. So I just don't bother doing it in the first place. Why would you? I can see it's grown. Hopefully you can see it's grown. Activity is what we have witnessed here happening overnight. It's good to go in your dough. It's gonna happen for you. I'm telling you. So get yourself a big bowl and pop them on the scales. Scoop out 100 grams of your sourdough starter and weigh it into your bowl. This is what it looks like. It's kind of like not as thick as it was before. It's still thick, but it's kind of more gloopy. And you're probably smelling a kind of acidic uh, nail polish kind of smell going on. Exactly the same as before. I've used a thermometer to make sure my water is at room temperature. Zero off the scales and weigh into the bowl with 325 grams. Now with my scraper, I'm gonna kind of cut it up like this. You can do it that way. Actually, more recently, I've become accustomed to whisking it all together like this. Because we're not kneading the dough here, it's nice to make a real starter, natural yeast rich mixture of water. That will ensure we will populate our whole dough with the yeasty, natural yeasty rich community. That's the way my brain works anyway. And also uh, whisking is kind of pleasing. I like it. To this, I'm gonna add 225 grams of strong white bread flour and 225 grams of wholemeal bread flour. Eight grams of salt will be plenty for this and I'm gonna mix it up with the side of my dough scraper, kind of mixing, kind of cutting all that moisture in together to bring everything together into a nice cohesive mass. Scrape off your dough scraper, scrape off your fingers, scrape around the bowl, make sure everything's nice and clean. Tuck your scraper down the side. Give your dough a little spritz with water just to ensure it doesn't dry out. Cover it with a cloth. Now we're gonna let it rest. Remember I said there's a five hour period between this mixing stage and the shaping and putting in the fridge ready to bake tomorrow. That's five hours. Within those five hours, we're gonna do something every hour. We're gonna rest it for an hour and then do the first fold. We're gonna rest it another hour and do a second fold. Then the third fold, then the pre-shape stage, and then the final shape. And then we put it in the fridge and we're done for the day. If we do it every hour, it just makes it easier to remember, doesn't it? Because it's wholemeal flour, I feel like it benefits from having those folding periods a little bit closer together in comparison to our white loaf recipe. Things kind of puff up a little bit faster and the structure is also weaker. So we bunch it all up to make sure we get a nice structure and final shape in the end. Plus it makes it easier to remember if we do it every hour. So then after the first hour's rest, we return to our dough to give it the first fold and this one's going to be around 12 to 15 folds it's going to be the heaviest fold of them all we're going to do less and less as we go along spritz the top of your dough with water spritz your table spritz your hands and spritz your scraper so that nothing sticks to anything turn your dough out onto that slippery wet patch and press it down with your fingers to spread it out slightly ready to stretch and fold and this is what i'm talking about take a little piece of dough from the edge pull it outwards and fold it over itself and then turn and repeat once twice, thrice, I don't know what four is, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Here you can see what's happening. The more we fold, the more that water's getting taken up by the dough and the sticker becomes underneath. So just keep your eye on it because you might need to tidy up a little bit like I'm gonna do here. See that sticky bit on the table underneath? I'm just gonna scrape it up, put it on the dough and then return to what I was doing. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I think it was 15, but I think I missed, I think I said nine twice. Now you're starting to see some kind of structure developing. We're beginning to get that nice round ball shape and it's gonna get better and better and better every single fold, I promise. Return it to the bowl, put your scraper down the edge for later, give it another spritz of water and cover with a cloth. Get yourself a dishcloth and wipe down your side all nice because if it dries, it's gonna stick like glue and you're gonna regret not wiping off earlier. Trust me. Leave your dough to rest for another hour. An hour later, it's fold number two time. Return to your dough and you probably won't notice much of a difference at this stage. In theory, your dough is gonna start getting puffier and puffier and that puff will accelerate uh, over time. So at this stage, it probably has puffed a tiny bit, but you probably won't notice much. So don't stress out about it. 
Again, you're gonna spritz your dough, spritz your hands, spritz the table, spritz your scraper and turn it out. This time paying attention to bring it out upside down. You're starting to build a structure now, it's got a top and a bottom. That smooth side on the top needs to come upside down so you're always performing your folds in the same places every stage. Press it out very gently again and then begin your folds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that's it. It's a weird number to stop on, but there you go. Here we're starting to get that dome. It's beginning to get some kind of elasticity and resistance that we're looking for. We're just performing enough folds to just retighten it back into a ball again. Back into the bowl, wipe down your side, spritz it with water and pop your cloth on top for another rest. Another hour later, it's time for the third fold. Oh yes, you should be starting to see a little bit of movement now, a little bit of puff and that's kind of silkiness arriving as the flour absorbs all the moisture. Spritz the side, spritz your hand, spritz the top of the dough and turn it out onto that wet piece of table upside down. Yeah, there it comes. Press it down even lighter still and then fold up again. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's probably enough. Roll over. Oh yes. You'll be starting to observe that silkiness now on the top and a real sense of structure being built. Wipe down your side, pop your scraper in the edge, spritz it with water, cover it with a cloth. You know the score by now. And an hour later, we're at the pre-shaped stage. This is where we stop using water and we start using flour to build that all important outside surface skin on our loaf. Puff should be witnessed at this stage. Increase in volume, have a smell. It smells properly wicked, a little bit acidic, starting to get that sourdough flavor. It smells great at this stage. I love it. Get yourself a little pot of dust ready. Dust the side of your table and dust the top of your dough. Remember, it's gonna be well wicked sticky because of all that water, so dust well. Shimmy your dough scraper down the edge to be able to turn your dough out upside down onto that floury patch. The moisture on the surface of your dough might absorb that flour that you dusted uh, the table with. So just go around with a scraper, um, shimmy in a little bit of dust underneath and any sticky areas to make sure your dough is not sticking. You can see while I'm doing this, that the dough is nice and puffy now. It's not too delicate that it may collapse. It's certainly got a very pleasing wobble on it, hasn't it? Activity is clearly evident. The dough is doing exactly what we want it to do. Spread your dough slightly from the edges, very, very slightly and very delicately, even less than last time now. And our pre-shaped stage becomes exactly the same as everything else, only on flour this time instead of water, retightening that structure. One fold. Two folds, three, four, five, one more, six, all the way around. I'm gonna roll it over now. Notice that my movement's are even more gentle this time around. I don't wanna lose that air inside that's been building all this time. A little bit of cup and turn just to tighten things up nicely. Look at that plump dough. I'm just gonna use my scraper to tidy up a little bit and then roll it over a little gesture of a cup and turn just to tighten it up a little bit. And you can see it's kind of soft, but it holds some kind of tension now, bringing a little bit of bounce. Yeah. Dust it nicely on the top and pop your cloth over. But we leave it for another, you guessed it, hour. After the final hour is up, remove your cloth and you'll see it's spread and puffed even more. Get yourself a Banneton basket and dust it liberally. I'm opting to use the liner this time. I don't know why. I just started using them uh, and I like them sometimes. I've noticed a few moist patches on the surface of the dough, so I'm using some dust from the table just to cover those areas and make sure it's not sticky. With my scraper, I'll turn the dough upside down very, very delicately, and this is the final shaping. I'm gonna do exactly what I did before, only this time a little bit more delicately. Flattening out, folding over. This time I'm not gonna commentate, I'm not gonna count. It's just nice to watch, isn't it? You can count in your heads if you want. This time I'm being even more careful and even more delicate. I don't wanna lose the air out of it. I want to tighten up the structure, but retain that puffiness inside so it's able to get even further while it's sitting in the fridge. The only thing I'm doing differently here is just rolling it over the other way so all the seams are underneath, kind of pushing it from the underneath, I guess, to tighten it up a little bit extra. Lovely. Oh man, look at it. Dust it nicely. Get your dough scraper underneath, upside down, into your basket. I'm gonna dust the top two and there it is. It's still got that softness, it's still got that air inside and just look at that wobble, it's so wicked! And then put it in the fridge. 
Controversially, I don't cover my dough with anything when I put it in the fridge. I just put it in the fridge bare to the wind. It does dry out a little bit, but not enough for me to be concerned about it. Do what you like. You wanna put a cloth on it? Put a cloth on it. But what I would never recommend is to wrap it up in plastic because it will surely steam up and end up sticking to your basket. It needs to be breathable to create that outside surface that will come away from the basket and be easy to score later. You know this already. We know this, don't you? I know you do. Once it's in the fridge, leave it there till the following day. And let's rejoin me uh, on the morning of day three. <laughs> if you are baking your loaf in a Dutch oven, get your Dutch oven in the oven, obviously, and turn your oven on to around 220 degrees C. I'm putting the kettle on here, but I'm just, I'm making coffee. There's nothing to do with the bread. I always preheat my Dutch oven. There's loads of techniques, other people doing other things and putting a cold Dutch oven, but um, I preheat mine, so there you go. 40 minutes or so, I feel like is enough to preheat your Dutch oven nicely. Uh, while you're waiting, you can get changed and then get your stuff out that you need. A couple of heavy cloths to put your Dutch oven down on, a Bake With Jack silicon sourdough sling, isn't that wonderful? Or some parchment paper to help you get it into your Dutch oven, and a grignette for slashing, and a spritzer gun as well. I like to spritz it a little bit. Lay out your cloths nicely, give you a big surface area. I always do this because I don't know if my Dutch oven's gonna scorch my table or not, but I'd rather not take the risk sometimes. You might wanna use a cooling rack or a wooden chopping board or something for this purpose. I like to use heavy cloths. Retrieve your dough from the oven and you shouldn't really see that much volume increase from the day before. A plumpness is what you're looking for, not a sagginess. Here's my dough, I'm gonna poke the surface for you if that means anything to you. A plumpness is what you're looking for. It looks plump, doesn't it? It kind of looks plump and bouncy, and that's what we go with. Turn it out onto your parchment paper or your silicon sourdough sling. You can purchase those from bakewithjack.co.uk forward slash shop if you like. You can get them elsewhere as well, but they're not my ones. And sometimes you've got a hole in the handle for no reason, but they always rip. That's why mine hasn't got a hole in the handle. Totally unnecessary. And then ponder on your design for far too long because you can't decide what you're gonna do on the top of your loaf. Get yourself a brush and dust off any of those areas where the flour might have built up. It's a good idea to overdust your basket in the first place so nothing sticks, because here you can always just brush it off the excess anyway. Tidy up all the excess flour because it's just gonna burn in the Dutch oven otherwise. And finally, when you procrastinated enough, it's time to commit to your slash on the top. I've gone for a square here, that's one slice that way and one slice, oh yeah. Oh yeah, it snagged. I remember now. Yeah, it snagged. It snagged. It's fine. Don't stress out about it. <laughs> you can see I'm kind of annoyed that that happened. I wasn't fully committed to the slash. Swift slash all the way across from one side to the other. And with the use the corner of the blade just to kind of nick those areas where it hasn't quite gone through. Uh, I'll turn it around and you can see where I fluffed it. <laughs> there it is. Slightly frustrating. But um, it's part of the game, like seriously, it's gonna be delicious bread. When you're all ready, go get your Dutch oven and put it on your cloth, take the lid off and lift your loaf into the Dutch oven. Wonderful, nice job, Jack. It's easy to forget that that lid's hot, but it's roasting hot. So don't forget your cloth when you get ready to put the lid on. A couple of spritzes of water inside. I feel like I like to do that because it probably creates a little bit more steam. Just feels like a nice thing to do. Put the lid back on. Uh, and pop it in the oven for 20 minutes. Set yourself an obnoxiously loud timer, apologies, for 20 minutes. When that timer goes off, retrieve your Dutch oven from the oven uh, and take the lid off to see how you've got on. This is always a very, very pleasing moment. Let's see how I got on, shall we? Ooh, fingers crossed. Yes, you should witness some kind of oven spring. This is probably the maximum oven spring that's gonna happen in that first 20 minute period. Look at that, it's busted open, lovely. Now pop it back in the oven, lid off for a further 20 minutes bake to get a beautiful crust and color. Get yourself a cooling rack and position it nicely, ready for the next bit. And now it's time to retrieve your loaf from the oven. Let's have a look, shall we? Yeah, nicely golden brown, crispy crust. If you let your sling handles cool just for a minute or so, you'll be able to touch it with your hands. They still get hot, but after like a minute, you'll be able to pick it up with your fingers without burning them. Lift out your proud loaf, pop it onto your wire rack and, and slide it off, let it cool down. Oh yeah, nice one. Not bad at all, if I do say so myself. And I do say so myself, I do. And for you stone bakers, get a stone in your oven on the middle shelf and a deep roasting tray on the shelf beneath. 
You're gonna to wanna to preheat this, again, the same as the Dutch oven, for about 40 minutes or so, getting nice and hot, boil the kettle. Get a large wooden peel, the kind that you use for a pizza and your grignette ready. Retrieve your dough from the fridge and turn it carefully upside down onto your peel, which is actually the right way up again, isn't it? Because you put it in the basket upside down, remember? Brush off any excess flour from your dough and brush the peel too, otherwise you'll slide all that flour onto the stone and it will just burn confidently score a square on the top or you can do a cross if you want and try and do it better than last time, yeah? Come on, there we have it. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that a lovely sight? Oh, man. Bring it over to the oven on the side, as close as possible, ready to load. Lift up your peel and give it a shimmy to make sure everything slides. Slide your loaf onto the hot stone in the oven and tip very carefully the hot water out of your kettle into that tray beneath. Close it up, and on this one, I'm gonna use the oven off technique we spoke about in video 195 in the hope of getting maximum oven spring. Turn off your oven completely, turn it off. Set your timer for 10 minutes and just leave that loaf in the hot box and watch it rise. The really cool thing about baking in a Dutch oven is that when you take that lid off, you get that wicked moment of like suspense and the reveal. Whereas when you're stone baking, you get to watch it rise up, which is really cool. After that 10 minute puff with the oven off, return to the oven and turn it back on 220 degrees. Set yourself a timer for 30 to 35 minutes to finish baking. Get your cooling rack ready, and when your loaf is done, slide it out onto the rack to cool. Check it out, we've got that wicked burst from leaving the oven off for the first 10 minutes. If you don't wanna do that, if you feel worried about it or you feel like it's risky, just bake the whole loaf from start to finish at 220 degrees for 40 minutes. Here, I did the first 10 with the oven off and then I left the next like kind of 30, 35 with the oven back on again. Wicked, lovely burst, crispy crust, man, we cracked it. It's always very pleasing and very rewarding when things go right with sourdough, but it doesn't always happen and that's okay. Two videos ago in number 198, I believe, I outlined some struggles I was having. And you might be having those same struggles, but stay strong and commit and keep practicing because when this happens and these come out like this, before you've even tasted it, man, you know you're onto a winner. Let them cool completely before you start slicing it up because if you slice it when it's warm, it'll likely be kind of gummy and kind of tacky and not very pleasant to eat. Let it cool, let all that excess moisture just settle down. Get yourself a decent knife and a decent chopping board and do the loaf justice. This is a whole meal loaf, remember, we don't get those big massive bubbles inside that I believe is entirely impractical anyway. We get a finer crumb texture. You can, if you want to, do this with 100% wholemeal flour. You're gonna to wanna to up the moisture, about 10 or 20 grams or so, and you'll end up with a loaf that's not in a bad way. It still has its place, it's just not to my taste. There is a slight difference between the one that's stone baked and the one that's baked in a Dutch oven. The Dutch oven is kind of lacking that real golden color and it's not as tall and proud as the other one. The crust is kind of thinner and the crumb is kind of moister. For me, the true difference between these two techniques is the technique itself, whether it's practical for you or it's not. Whether you enjoy stone baking or you kind of want a low maintenance way of just baking one loaf at a time in a Dutch oven, that's fine. I hope you enjoyed this recipe. It's been a long time coming. Have a crack at it. Let me know how you get on. Enjoy making sourdough this sourdough September. And I hope you enjoy all the other sourdough videos that have gone out this year and the previous years. Because I think there's so much to learn about sourdough from both our successes and from our failures. It's a long-term journey, remember that. Try not to get down in the dumps if things don't go bang on first time round. Hopefully there's enough advice and observation in this video for you to make your own decisions at home with your sourdough. Really get to grips with it and really make it your own and have great success for life. Thank you for being here. Thanks to all patrons. Thanks to everyone dropping super thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks a million. If you weren't here, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere else. I don't know where. Worst outro ever. See ya.